All right, good morning. If you're just joining us, it's the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. And if you've been there, you know it's time for Up the Press. And I have more than one analyst this morning. So it's going to be a very robust discussion we'll be having this morning on Up the Press. I have Mr. Nick Agole, public affairs analyst, joining us from London. And our regular Tuesday analyst, Mr. Chris Kendewandu, member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK. He's joining us from Canada. Good morning to you, gentlemen. Good morning, Meno. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You're welcome. OK, so we'll be taking a look at three newspapers this morning. But we begin with the Guardian newspaper. And the Guardian is leading with cautious optimism as FG adopts piecemeal negotiation out of $800 million stock funds. It's their big story. And the details of that can be found on page six. And uh, you have uh, some uh, summaries here. Almost one year of visa ban lifted. October 18, 2022 till September 11, 2023, over $800 million of foreign airlines fund stock in Nigeria. And then FG UAE may explore Egypt's bailout option. Let's, let's talk about this. Good as thing, you guys are regular travelers. Chris, let's begin with you. Yes, um, the... Uh, I think it was a major break yesterday uh, when the president uh, well, we visited UAE and we uh, were able to resolve the living problem um, between Nigeria and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, not only the visa ban on Nigerians, and, uh, but also the issue of uh, flights, um, the issue of flights, uh, Emirates and the Etihad coming into Nigeria. So. Uh, but we need to know the genesis of the problem. For the flights we had issued, uh, it was based on the fact that one, most of the funds uh, belonging to these airlines uh, we are not being repatriated. And um, the United Arab Emirates, especially Etihad and, uh, and Emirates, felt that um, it was not getting the best uh, out of this situation. Um, and that was one. The second one was also the issue of. Um, the number of Nigerian flights that are finding their way into um, into the United Arab Emirates we had issued a long time. We are a particular airline talking to a Nigerian uh, airline operates of the airpiece. Uh, we are finding it difficult to make the rounds as it were due to the incessant uh, problem being given them by the United Arab Emirates uh, authorities. So. For that, it was a, a tough one. And um, the former president visited, former president, I know that, Buhari visited United Arab Emirates. I thought that was a sub, but continuously we had issue. Then and also coupled with the fact that also there was a time that some Nigerians had um, issued, issued in the United Arab Emirates, the White Street, and, um, and a lot of things. And that issue was not resolved until the former president left. So by yesterday, when the president finished from the G20 conference, uh, summit uh, in, uh, in the state to go to the United Arab Emirates, and it was good that that was what came out of it. So good one. Um, but I think that I personally believe that it should go beyond that. Apart from just lifting the visa ban and also allowing these, those two allies to come into Nigeria. The fact is that what is it also that our own at our own end? What are we getting? Are we going to have more Nigeria uh, 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 fly into um, Dubai as it were? Because it's supposed to be a bilateral um, yes. agreement. So mm -hmm. it, it mustn't favor just United Arab Emirates. Nigeria must also get something out of it. But yep. it's good that this has been resolved. And um, there's going to be a resumption of a fight between. Nigeria and the United Arab Emirates as well as um, the yeah. visa ban. All right, um, Nick. Yes. Your take on that? Yes. So um, this is one of the problems that was created by government. You see, I always say this thing: elsewhere, government is there to solve problems. 
in Nigeria, government actively creates problems. And then they spend the whole time attempting to solve the problems. And yet the problems are not solved. And this is one of them. And how did we come to this problem? The Central Bank of Nigeria told the airlines fair tickets at the so-called official rate. And as at that time, uh, the rate was like, the rate differed from the power market rate. Uh, as at the time this government came in, we all know the rate was like uh, 400 and, and 50 before the whole thing was floated. Hmm. Now, the, the, a passenger in Nigeria wants to travel out. The airline said they want to sell a ticket for $1,000. We now cost that ticket as $450,000. And then the airline collects $450,000 Naira and sell the ticket. But the airline cannot get their $1,000 if they go to the Malam. If they give 450000 to the Malam, the Malam will probably give them something like $500. So the central bank promised them that they will give them the $1,000 hmm. and collect the 450000 hmm. And this central bank did not have the $1,000 again because the NMPC that used to drop dollars in the central bank coffers as proceeds from our crude oil sales was no longer dropping the money. Hmm. And that is where this accumulation of the money got to this $800 million. So this $800 million is that the airlines have the Naira they collected from travelers. They are waiting on the central bank to give them $800 million at the rate of 450 Naira to a dollar. And that money is not there. Why did the government bother to create this problem? I mean, if someone is well enough and he wants to travel out, allow the person to buy their ticket at the parallel market rate at which the airline will just approach a malam and give the malam the naira and collect their dollar and go. Yet the Nigerian government created this problem. They couldn't solve this problem. And this problem now led to this crisis that the president just went to try and set to, and it caused more misery to Nigerian travelers. Because let us not forget, the Emirates Airlines hmm. and Qatar Air, all of them, they were, I mean, not Etihad. Uh, Emirates and Etihad, they are of the same country. They, 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 they were coming to Nigeria. I think Emirates was running like two frequencies here to Lagos, one into Abuja. I think at the point they were even running two into Abuja. That's four. Etihad into Abuja, Etihad in Lagos. So we had a like six points out of the country that was taking off, leaving us in the hands of the British Airways and all of that to exploit. Hmm. So I'm, I'm happy now we are on the way to solving this, but the most sustainable way to solve this thing is for the federal government not to get themselves involved in a business like this. Hmm. If the dollar is now about 890 to a dollar, and I mean 890 naira to a dollar, and the Nigerian still feels that he wants to travel abroad, let them fund their travel. Government should not be taking dollars that is meant for poor people and giving it to rich people who are traveling. So this is the way to solve the problem. And I hope President Tinubu knows that that is the most sustainable solution to this matter. Indeed, a step in the right direction. And I'm, I'm so glad you've kind of broken down this, uh, the genesis of how these funds were trapped. Uh, oftentimes, I found that when you're discussing with some Nigerians who are wondering, what's all these uh, trapped funds all about? And you try to explain, they, they think it's, it's a way of, uh, or they think that the CBN actually stole the money. Um, but it's good that you've given a clearer picture of how it accumulated to what it is today. Uh, let's move forward to some of the headlines here on the Guardian newspaper. I'll, I'll just read some of them out and then you talk on two. You have 7,000 Nigerians die yearly from cancer. That would be, um, details of that is on page five. You have Nigeria's microfinance banking dream on brink of failure. If you want to read that, you find details of that is their news analysis on page four. And then you have end of an era. 
in accounting profession as Akintola Williams bows out. I think we should touch on that. Akintola Williams, who doesn't know him? You know, when you talk about accounting in Nigeria, you mention his name. And he's bowing out at a very good ripe age of 104. You want to talk about that? Chris. Okay, Nick, you're, you're, you're in the picture. Nick, let's have yes. your thoughts on Akintola Williams. I, I, I'm actually a chartered accountant. Oh. So, yes, I, I, I qualified as a chartered accountant in 1992. So that's, that's 31 years ago. Akintola Williams is the doyle of accountancy profession in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. His uh, icon number is 001, <laughs> while mine is 7,347. That number go. today is approaching 60,000. There you which go. Which is the number of chartered accountants we have in Nigeria. So he's, uh, he has served Nigeria well. Mm -hmm. He has uh, you know, been very influential in getting the accountancy profession to where it is today and he has fought for the cause of this country now his job has been done 104 years is a long long life that he has lived we have nothing else to say than to thank god for this long life that he has given to us and we wish him well and may his soul rest in peace Chris, I know you want to also give your thoughts on the late Akintola William. Akintola Williams is a man of honor uh, that, um, that um, um, over the years has become uh, an icon, in not only in accounting, but other professions that uh, find themselves in the doing of accounting profession in Nigeria. And um, whatever the accounting profession uh, is in, in Nigeria today, can to a large extent be attributed to someone like him. It's um, just like uh, what Rotimi uh, Williams was to the legal profession uh, in those days. So uh, it's, uh, this is a celebration of life. Uh, a man that lived up to 104. Some people in Nigeria don't live up to that half that age. So, and um, he, has, he was able to carry himself exemplarily as uh, a Nigerian and a statesman. And the most important aspect that I like about him is that throughout his years, he never got himself involved in politics. He was mm. so professional that he was focused on what he was doing. So his demise yesterday will rob the idea of, um, of his experience uh, as an accountant, as a statesman. And my heart goes out to the family, as well as um, all those that are close to him, as well as the uh, accounting profession in Nigeria. Then, unless about uh, another topic that I raised, the issue of cancer. The number of Nigerians uh, that are uh, bothered with cancer. Um, it is not surprising. I'm sure that we have more than that figure. Uh, but the, but that figure that we give by Freddy is not the right. And that is part of the problem we are having in Nigeria because access to um, healthcare is a big issue. It's a very, very big issue. Not only cancer, kidney, heart related diseases, and so many other diseases that most of them are not. Because of our level of poverty, Nigerians cannot assess um, uh, health care. Yes. Let me give you a classical example. Here in Canada, I was shocked to learn that once you're a Canadian, you have free access to no matter what uh, your condition. You'll be treated practically free once you are a Canadian. And that is part of the issue there. I mean, some other countries could be busy, but you also look at the, you also know that you know so that you have the NIS, most of them have this uh, um, uh, this NIS that uh, help them uh, in taking care of some of these issues. But in Nigeria, is a problem. So the issue of cancer has been a problem with us. And in the Western world, the solution is being found. It's no longer a death sentence as it were. Some solution that there so many people that have been cured of cancer. Um, in Nigeria also, we had some of the, especially within the uh, public sector, there are some private um, hospitals in Nigeria. I know that um, can be able to do that, but how many people can afford, afford that? It. So that is what I mean. Yes. And such, I and such a large number, 78,000 dying yearly. That is a very so huge it, number. That's a very, very, very large number. 78,000, that is a very, very large number. Yes, and before we leave the Guardian newspaper, this story that has to do with the NDDC fraud, 
2.9 billion Naira NDDC fraud. Age to XMD, two others back, six year jail term. Finally, Chris, is that, the, <laughs> is that the sense you're getting from this? Finally, are people going to begin to answer to, you know, are, are they going to, are we going to be, begin to see justice? I mean, that's the slap on the wrist. You remember the issue of uh, off the mic, off the mic. We know all those that were involved. We saw the, uh, the probe by the House of Representatives and how that passed that I had. NDDC has been one of the most corrupt uh, prostitutes in Nigeria's history. And that is my personal opinion because if you see the number of funds, that, and that's why some of our listeners ask the question that why is it that so much money is being pumped? into the Niger data and not as visual for it is visual for it. Mm -hmm. So if we have decided to start prosecuting some of those um that's what have been involved in this place, then all well and good. But to me these are just the small boy. The bigger fish are somewhere and they, they need to be good. even a, 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 a former minister uh, who is also a, a senior legislator now was fingered in this crisis and what happened. So it has always been like that. There was a forensic um audit that was done at one time, that was, um, which even cost so much money, millions and millions of naira was put into that by the Buari administration. And you continue to ask yourself, what was the outcome of that forensic audit uh, of LDDC? So, but if we decided to start doing the need to by making sure that some of those that dip their hands into the coffers of uh, NDDC and deprive the people of Niger data of their uh, dividends of democracy, all well and good. But I just think that this is not just a slap on the wrist and just a, a shadow boxing uh, as it were. And interesting, well, this is just the aid to the XMD. Uh, and that's, why other... say, that's why I say these are just the small boys. Mm, the the small boys, boys yes. Yeah. This one has the small boys now. Mm. They are the small boys. Mm. It's, it's the same way that people are saying uh, you can't be holding a mefele and asking him questions if you don't ask his boss questions as well, isn't it? Mm. Okay, so uh, well. okay, let's move to the Punch newspaper. It leads with Tinubu's special investigator for CBN audited reports. And did, uh, the writers there, Central Bank allegedly pays over 400 million naira IFRS Academy for accounting um, guidelines. I take that again. Central Bank allegedly pays over 400 million naira to IFRS Academy for auditing guidelines. Then you have DSS to summon FR, FRC bus top directors as CBN special investigator Deepin's probe. Nick, what do we know about this? Yeah, so uh, anywhere in Nigeria that you attempt to open a cupboard, the kind of dead bodies you see filled inside is always uh, mind blowing. Very, very, very nauseating. Uh, the, the, the CBN special investigator is someone I know very well. He was a year my senior in uh, Uniben, and after he graduated, he was retained. And after I graduated, I was retained. So we became colleagues as uh, graduate assistants in the Department of Accounting. He's a thoroughbred professional, and he is doing a good job. Uh, but I can assure you that when we're talking about 400 million naira, we have not even touched on the big cheeses that exist in that central bank. You know, you made the question, you made the, uh, you made the point just now that uh, uh, when people talk about uh, the former governor of the CBN, uh, Godwin Emiefele, uh, they should talk about the boss. But the question is that whether the boss was aware of what Governor Emiefele was doing in the CBN. You know, because that was a boss that we're not too sure if he was aware of what was happening around him in government circles. So Nigeria is a filthy place. And to me, President Tinubu just needs to have a single point agenda. And his single point agenda is law enforcement. Whoever goes against the laws of the land, he should follow. Once he focuses on bringing to book those who are running against our constitution and laws, just like uh, my co-panelist Chris has said, mm. his job is done. Once he enforces the law, every other thing is going to fall in place in that country. Because right now, as we have in that country, I wanted to make a point about uh, the cancer. You know, this is arising from lack of public health. Nigeria does not have public health. 
You look at the fumes coming from Okadas and all the trucks and all of that, fumes coming from generators, the unkempt environment, the gutters, and the kind of, you go to the market, see how meat is treated. Instead of, of killing uh, cows in abattoirs, very distant, hygienic places, they keep this thing in gutters, use gutter uh, water to, this is, what, I think, why won't people be sick? Mm. So, I mean, government just needs to go back to the basics. Mm. Okay, Chris, um, let's, let me read the other headlines here so that we can um, touch on maybe three of them and then proceed to the next newspaper. Above the masthead, you have operators excited as UAE lifts visa ban on Nigeria. We've talked about that. Nigerians, Morocco earthquake death toll rises to 2,700. This is a very sad one. Uh, the death toll keeps rising in, in Morocco. Pengasin reacts as Dangote refinery misses production deadline. Chris, can you touch on that? Because we had thought that before now, Dangote uh, refinery would have been giving us fuel. But here we are, September 12th. Nada. Well, some of us. Some of us saw this coming, and um, some of us warned that the over reliance on this tangative uh, petroleum is going to be a problem for us because the last government seems to have put all these eggs in one basket by believing that the, the coming up of Dangote petroleum will solve all Nigerian, uh, Nigerian uh, petroleum problem, and that is what we are seeing now, and that is a fallacy. It's a fallacy, as it were. We went as far as even investing about 20% of the federal government uh, in that refinery. And this is where we are. Because it is not easy. And I continue to ask myself, why do we go this route every time and then um, make a mockery of ourselves? We saw the pageantry and the, 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 uh, the uh, how uh, elaborate the, the commissioning of that uh, refinery was done by the former president at the wee hours of his living office. I don't know why they decided to, to do that, that jampuri. When they knew that they were not right, um, yeah, I don't know the whole essence. We were promised that at the beginning of the year that production will start. Now it has not started. It has been moved about two or three times, and yet we don't have a solution. And that is what is going to happen. Safe time will turn off that. At the end of it, we will just end up with one big elephant in the room, which is Angote Refinery. And that, that refinery, it means that also we are going to have a monopoly within the system where, just like we're having in cement and some other uh, products, uh, which Angote has a monopoly. Uh, and he determines the cost of um, petrol products. But good enough, this government seems to be waking up and um, at least taking up the responsibility that was left for over eight years by the last administration. Now we have been told that the, uh, the refinery in Portacourt will start uh, production in December this year. And another one was that we come on um, by early first quarter of next year. So if we can have that, then all well, it has always been that my belief and so that of so many people that we cannot continue importing petroleum products. We seem to be the only country, oil producing country in the world that um, that drains crude oil export and decide to import petroleum product, which is why the prices of this product will continue to rise on a daily basis based on market forces. So uh, over reliance on the good day, petroleum is not going to help the problem. It can only help us to have a short uh, a, a short gap, mm. and um, so but. It is quite unfortunate that um, this has not been. The Dangote uh, made itself um, the industry or group doesn't seem to be giving us enough information as to what will happen. But it is within their purview to do that. Uh, they have the right to keep the to whatever information. After all, is a private entity. But don't forget, as I said, Nigeria has 25% uh, equity in mm -hmm. that uh, corporation. And whatever happens should be of interest to Nigerians. Definitely. Okay, let's move to the next newspaper, and that's the Nation newspaper. It leads with Tinubu strikes multiple deals with Germany, Korea, and India. Of course, that's uh, <laughs> talking about the G20 that just ended on the 10th of this month. And then you have above the masthead, President fair to Igbo with appointment, says Soludo. Um, acquisition of b banks, CBN Deputy Governor Quist. Okay, let's look at these three. Perhaps we let go of the headline and go to 
uh, President Fair to Igbo with appointment. Uh, that's uh, what Saludo is saying. Chris, you're an Igbo man. Is he speaking your mind? Is he speaking for the rest of the Indigo when he says that the presidency, the President Tinubu has been fair to Indigos? Just speaking for himself. He's not speaking for any Igbo <laughs> man. It's just an, as an Igbo as, Igbo as I am. So I don't see how fair the presidency have been to um, the Igbos. Um, don't forget, uh, um, uh, uh, Governor Soludo come vast seriously for this president during the presidential election. Even the person from his state, his predecessor, uh, he tried to rub he rubbish, not only tried to rubbish, he rubbished him during the presidential election and saying that he cannot win, win an election in Nigeria. And um, so, uh, Professor Soludo is somebody that brought so much hope to the policy, and most people believe that uh, this coming is going to solve a lot of problems. And um, when you look at it, his pedigree as the former central bank governor and um, uh, a financial guru, how well he has been able to do that in Anakra State, just to be uh, it's, uh, it's not for me. Uh, by the time he finishes tenure, uh, Anakra people and prosperity will be able to judge. But um, so far, I wouldn't see how the, uh, that, with all sense of uh, humility, um, this president is a bit much more better uh, in terms of balancing appointment across board, unlike what we had in the Buhari administration. You can see so many uh, Nigerians uh, from all walks of life, uh, from different parts of this country, getting a, post, a position in, uh, in his uh, government. So I don't know why Soledo want to just single out to the people's place. Would the Yoruba say that uh, he has been fair uh, to them in his appointment? What are those from the north? I think that in fact, in fact, there. Chris, those from the north, those from the north, uh, some of them are saying that look, this is too too many Yorubas in this cabinet. Uh, oh, and then oh, the Yorubas oh, are oh. saying, yeah. the Yorubas are saying, when the President Buhari was in power, why didn't you say he was giving too many positions to the northerners? Why are you crying foul now? And so you know, it just. It, it, that's just the narrative we're hearing uh, yeah. with regards to the appointments. But let's go back to the Punch newspaper and touch on something briefly before we wrap this up. Why? Because we've seen a lot of such cases, you know, repeatedly in the news where men kill women and women kill men when love goes sour. Um, court remands jealous lover for killing girlfriend. Pages, uh, details of that you find on pages four and five of the Punch newspaper, if you're interested in the details. Gentlemen, do you have details of this gist? Nick, Chris? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have details. I've, I've not uh, read that story, but um, they, they, this, this is an ongoing uh, decima. In fact, uh, it's even more worrying, and especially in the United States, in the diaspora, that Nigerians uh, keep killing uh, their spouses. Yes, there's even one in the and news case, right now. Mm -hmm. Hello. Can yeah, go ahead. Now? You froze a bit, so I had to come in. Oh, oh yes. So the, the most recent case in the U.S. is in Orlando, where a Nigerian uh, shot his wife uh, yes. dead. Uh, so this, these things happen. Unfortunately, they happen in uh, the developed world here. Um, in the UK, you have, in fact, if a, a man or woman is shot or killed in some way, uh, the police first look within before they begin to look outside the home. So I think people just need to exercise emotional intelligence. We all just need to take it uh, easy because, you see, at the end of the day, where we are in this world now, we're just on a, on a drama stage. At the end of it, our role in this drama will end and we'll take our exit. There's really nothing in this life. Mm. Chris, do you know anything about it? You have, your, you have a site that, you know, you're a blogger. So what do you know about this story? Well, the, the, the headline is, a, is enough to give uh, um, the said a jealous uh, husband. It has always been that of being jealous, most often than not. I don't think that violence has been uh, an issue. And uh, this is part of what uh, we part to uh, the, the every day, not only in Nigeria, just as you rightly said, but across the globe. And um, if you look at our laws, I know that most often than not, one of the best courses I read uh, as a law student was family law. And um, it's, it, it exposes a lot about uh, the, the 
domestic violence, the relationship between spouses and the rest of them. And most often than not, people get so emotional that they cannot be, they will not be able to handle it and the result to it. I remember vividly uh, some years back, I remember vividly uh, the case of a particular lady, um, a banker, one of the bankers that was um, killed by the husband in Lagos. Mm -hmm. And um, I was the one of, I was the one that facilitated the arrest of the husband uh, who was on his way out of Nigeria. He was almost getting out of Nigeria through the border. Mm. But with the intelligence I had then, uh, as a reporter, I was able to pin him down and use all manner of um, uh, approach that I could to be able to bring him back to Lagos. And, and um, he surrendered he signed to me uh, as it were some years back. And um, before I handed him over to the current um, uh, COS to the, the IG, uh, CP, Twinji, um, this suit. And uh, he has been prosecuted and is having a life uh, sentence uh, in Lagos. So, it's, it's domestic violence is, uh, and that is why we continue to tell people that if it is not working, it's not working. Take exactly. a walk. Take a walk. Take a Take walk. A walk. Uh, and, and, and the part of the problem is that because of the kind of mentality and the kind of uh, family um, peers and religion that people get there say, okay, oh, what will our my people say? What the people in church will say? What is it? The same people that you are afraid of, what they will say. By the time you die, that is where they will be. They don't give a hoot. Take a walk. And that is it. And um, and that's where it's supposed to be. And, uh, and it's just as simple as that, you know, you understand what I mean? I understand totally. Chris Gendemwandu, member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK. Thank you so much for joining us from Canada this morning on Of The Press. Thank you very much. Let me go back to my sleep. <laughs> Enjoy <laughs> yourself. Sweet dreams. Nick Agule thank has joined you. us from London. Nick Agule, thank you so much for your time on Of The Press. And thank you very much, Nigerians, and have a nice day. All right, so stay with us. We'll be coming right back with the first hot topic.